Welcome everyone to the webinar, Plant Galls for the Curious Naturalist. My name is Deb Kramer and I'm the Executive Director of Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful. We work with the community towards a vibrant and healthy Coyote Creek. One of the ways we do that is through educational programs like this one. I'll be your moderator. Presenting today are two wonderful and experienced naturalists from whom I've learned so much. I'm looking forward to introducing them to you. I hope you have a good tour of Gaul and what they're all about during this webinar. Now I'd like to welcome the presenters. Marav von Schack is an ecologist and an entomologist. She really likes bugs. She has been involved in community science for over 10 years, organizing BioBlitz events, leading a road ecology team, and teaching. She founded the BioBlitz Club and has been organizing public events for five years. Michael Hawk is founder of Jumpstart Nature and Nature's Archive podcast, an ex-Google tech leader, a certified California naturalist, and board member for the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. His latest endeavor, Jumpstart Nature, seeks to empower everyone to make a difference for the environment by using technology to connect people to nature and conservation. Okay, can you see my presentation okay? Yes. Yeah? Awesome. Okay, so let's get started. During the presentation, we will talk about what are goals, how are they formed, uh, which organisms induce them, how you could find them, and how you could decide if something is a goal or not a goal, and how you should uh, document them on, on iNaturalist if you choose to do so. I'd like to say uh, one thing before we get started. Although I'm an entomologist, I'm not a goal expert. I just find them fascinating and I love uh, documenting them, searching for them, learning about them. And I'd like to share this uh, enthusiasm with you guys, but not as a goal expert. Okay, so uh, this presentation has lots of photos from the Bay Area, but most of the information would apply to other places as well. Uh, in the Bay Area, one of the most common goals that most people notice is uh, on these valley oaks, huge, beautiful oaks that we see uh, in certain places. And they grow these beautiful apples, which are kind of weird little structures. But then oaks don't actually grow apples, right? They grow acorns. So anything you see on an oak that is not an acorn or leaf or twig and is actually attached to the plant could be a gall. And this uh, creature, this little home, is uh, a home for a little wasp called California gall wasp. But if you look closely, especially on the oaks, you might find all sorts of brilliant colors and shapes and little structures that most people really don't know exist. So what are these galls and how are they formed? So galls are structured growth on plant of plant tissue. So it's part of the plant. It's not something that is attached. It's not silk. It's not anything like that, but it's part of the plant growth. It's produced by the plant, the plant host in response to a mechanical or chemi chemical stimulation. It is induced by an adult or a larva of insects or mites or by fungi. <coughs> Excuse me. And the mechanism, uh, varies according to the plant and the gall inducers. And I will give you some examples. Galls are formed on mainly on leaves, stems, petiole, and branches, but could also be on buds, flowers, seeds, roots, and fruits. Uh, and these are just a few examples. Oh, I think you can't actually see part of my presentation here. So, sorry, let me change my screen a bit. Okay, I think now it should be good. Um, okay, so they are formed on different uh, parts of the plant. And when we look at common type of, types of galls, we, if we look at uh, twig galls, then there's some that are detachable uh, stem galls, like this one on the left, that is kind of like sitting on top of that gall, of that uh, branch. And these are the integral stem galls, which are part of, this, of the stem and could even uh, interfere with 
the nutrient of, uh, flow in the stem. When we look at uh, leaf galls, then simple ones would be a roll, uh, leaf roll gall or leaf fold gall, but there are many other options uh, like pouch gall, bead gall, rhenium gall, and we'll talk a little bit about some examples for these galls later. Um, it's really important to talk about the host plants. So galls are highly specific to plant species. And if you know the plant, you would often be able to ID the gall. And the other way around. So if you uh, know the galls, you could uh, identify the plant. So as an entomologist, I didn't know most of the plants here, but I learned the galls and then I learned a lot about the host plants. Uh, and you could do it as well. Uh, seven families and genera uh, support galls across most geographies. So it doesn't really matter where you live. If you find an oak, you are somewhat likely to find some uh, galls on it. Uh, so oaks, hickories, willows, populus, uh, hackberries, goldenrods, these are some of the best host plants. Uh, in the Western US, uh, using a wonderful book, the uh, Western uh, plant galls of the Western United States. We know that oaks are the best host plant, but then willows, cottonwood, uh, crescent bush, rabbit brush, and many others are also good host plants. So that if you're just getting started, if you'd like to join Gall Week and go out and document galls, then what you could do is look for one of these super hosts and find galls on them. If we look at other places, then um, across the US, oaks are still the best host plant. But then willows, hickories, um, poplars, golden ro roses, and others are also really important uh, host plants. So we highly encourage you to look at those as well. And now let's talk a little bit about the gall inducing organisms. And this is just a partial list. So there's some fungus. Uh, three different families of fungus that could induce galls, like this one in the photo. Uh, mites, aphids, moth, gall midges, which depend on their galls for feeding. Uh, Soulflies, gall wasps, which we will talk about, at, uh, some of these groups we'll talk about later, and then beetles and fruit flies. So now let's, let's talk a little bit more about some of these groups. Uh, mites. So mites are uh, tiny arachnids, uh, closely related to ticks. And you might have noticed mites uh, free living on uh, rocks, on the ground, on plants. But the mites here are actually microscopical. It took me a long time to find some today in one of these oak uh, galls uh, under my microscope. But you can't actually see these mites. They're very, very small. Uh, but they uh, produced this, they induced this pretty boring, I don't know how to call these galls. They're not too exciting, not very colorful, but still very interesting. Usually they'll have a bump from uh, on the top side of the leaf and little uh, hairs on the bottom of the leaf. And that's where the mites are found. And uh, they're a bit less specific than other uh, gall inducers. And another interesting thing about them is that this is probably the least known group of all the gall inducers. There are many species that still need to be discovered, still need to be um, described by a scientist that would give them a scientific name uh, and will help us all learn about them. So we really need more information about this group. Um, the next group are aphids. So some aphids have complex life cycles with uh, alternate hosts and alternate generations. Uh, others might have just one host and a more simple life cycle. Uh, in some of them, like this one on cottonwood, uh, a slit will open up on the gall at some point, allowing the aphids to go in and out of the gall, but also ants uh, can go into the gall and take care of these aphids and get some honeydew from them. So these are all Argentine ants here, and these are the little aphids uh, hiding inside the gall. Um, when we look at moth, then that three different families that uh, some of them, in some of the species induce galls. 
Um, the goal is induced by the larval uh, feeding behavior. They could look like a stem goal, like this one on Coyote Brush, or kind of like a rock candy or a taco. When they, it's a pretty simple goal where the leaf is folded. Gull midges are a very large uh, family of flies um, with over 6,000 species worldwide and over 1,100 species in North America. Um, they're very diverse. So often if you look at plants that are not oaks, you might find gull uh, midges because they use many different host plants. And some of them are inquilins or even predators of other uh, gull midges. And I'll explain these terms at the end. Okay, so you see that here that they're pretty diverse in the way they look and also in the host plant that they use. The next group is the soulflies. Soulflies are a primitive group of wasps. Some of them are free living, even on the same host plant, like this willow, you could find some free living uh, soulfly larva and other species that induce galls. Uh, like this one. This is a very common species in the Bay Area. Uh, and it's interesting because in this family, the gull uh, formation begins with the egg laying uh, of the adult female. Okay, so the female would lay its eggs and then the gull would start forming. So that means that if something happens to that egg or later on to the larva, the gull would still be there. Okay, so it, it will be empty if it died, but it will still be there and kind of look the same. Uh, unlike some of the other gall inducers where uh, the gall is induced by the lava. Okay, so now I'd like to talk a little bit more about this group. These are the gall wasps, the CPs, uh, with over 800 species in North America. And most of the species develop on oaks, but some of them use uh, rose family uh, plants like rose. The gall is induced by the developing lava in this case. So if something happens to that lava, the gall would stop forming or it would look a bit weird. And I'll get back to this point. Um, the galls are complex with multiple layers of tissues and they always have an internal chamber. So the gall morphology is different than in other groups. And they can have many chambers or just one. Uh, depending on the species. So there could be just one larva in a little gull or a few of them in a larger gull. And it could be that we still don't know about 25% of the species only in, in the Bay Area. So there's still a lot we don't know about these uh, uh, gulls, even though these are pretty colorful and you know somewhat easier to find depending on the species. Let's talk a little bit about their life cycle. So some of the species have alternate generations, which I find very interesting. So I'd like to talk about it a little bit. Um, so let's start with the fall generation. The fall generation just now starts in the summer or a bit later, depending on the species. And it has to survive the winter. Inside the gall, you'll have the unisexual generation with only females inside. In the spring, the spring generation has pretty good growing conditions. So they usually are short-lived and develop pretty fast because there's so much nutrients uh, flow, flowing in that uh, host plant. Inside the gall, we'll have the bisexual or sexual generation, which has both male and female inside. This is really interesting because the alternate generation galls of the same species can look different. And even the wasp could look different. A female wasp of fall generation and spring generation of the same species could look very different, which I think is amazing. And they could even use different parts of the same plant. So for example, because I know this is a bit confusing, let's look at the live oak apple gall uh, from a coast live oak here in the Bay Area. So in the summer uh, and fall, we will see these galls forming. Okay, this is a bright new uh, green uh, gall. The wasps are still inside. Um, they will form in there, feeding on the gall, doing their thing. And then around between January and March, the females will emerge. And they will, since they're only females, they will reproduce paternogenetically without males. They will lay their eggs um, 
on leaf buds. So this one was on a twig, on a little branch. And this generation is actually on the leaf. So they changed the plant part. Um, and inside these galls will have both males and females. So that uh, between May and June, uh, the, the new wasps will emerge and uh, maybe fly a little bit. They're usually not good flyers. They don't live very long, especially once they emerge from the gall. Uh, they mate and then the females will lay their eggs in stem buds because uh, these galls would form on the twigs. Okay. And then again, females only, males and females, and it goes on. Uh, sometimes you can find both generations on the same plant because uh, they would kind of turn brown and woody after a while. So they might stay there. Uh, and you could find more than one generation on the same tree. But the gall inducing wasp is not alone. Different things would happen to it. So although they induce this beautiful shelter that protects them inside, nature always finds a way, right? So predators would find uh, the little lava inside the gall and try and get them like these birds that were pecking on the apple galls. In addition, we have inquilines, which are usually closely related species from the same family. Uh, they will use uh, the same gall. So inquilines are kind of like uh, roommates that you didn't invite. They join the other uh, gall inducer uh, gall. So there's one wasp that already created the gall and the other one, this is the one in the middle, okay? So this is the one that made a tree create a little structure, but this is an inquilin. So this is another sp uh, species that laid its egg into an existing gall or a forming gall. And then we have two species now, okay? So remember that the lava here is the one that is forming the gall, which means that if something happens to that lava, the gall shape might change. So it might affect the way that the gall looks like. We also might have parasites. So those would actually uh, kill the host larva. The wasp, which is not a snippy wasp, will lay its egg directly on the host larva and their larva would feed on uh, the gall host, okay? The, the larva that induced the gall. And these are a couple of examples. So these are uh, normal galls on the left here and here. Um, and that's the way they're supposed to look like. But on the right, you see the same species, but looking pretty different. So we don't really know what happened there. We need to open them and let the adult emerge and see what's, what happened. But it could be that there was an inquilin there that possibly ate the host. Uh, it could be a parasite that killed the host. And then the way that the gall would look like would change. And I want to say that because Gulls in general are pretty easy to ID as long as the species was described by someone before that and you have a good guide you could use. But sometimes they have some, you know, uninvited guests in there that would change the way the gull look like. But those are actually pretty interesting to watch. And if you go out the right time of the year, which is, you know, a bit later after these galls are already formed, usually, you might see some of the parasites or the inquilins walking around the galls, looking for the right angle uh, to lay their eggs. Look at this crazy ovipositor. This is how the, this wasp is going to lay its eggs directly into the gall. Okay, so in this point, I'd like to stop sharing my screen for a couple of minutes and we'll do some Q&A quickly and then we'll continue with the presentation. Okay, so I see a question about the gall mites. Uh, so thank you for that question because people all often you know, hear about wasps and mites and they're really worried that this could be uh, a health, health uh, risk for them. But I'd like to say that it's not. So these mice are only interested in the tree. And again, you saw that they're microscopical. They're really tiny. You can't actually see them. Uh, they only feed on the tree and they're pretty specific. So they would use only an oak or closely related oaks. Um, same with the wasps. So these are not yellow jackets. These are tiny wasps that only care about their trees. They can't sting even if they'd like to. They don't have a nest to protect. So they're not protective in any way. So you don't need to worry about them. I think they just add beautiful diversity to your yard or 
to your park or wherever you see them. So there was a question, uh, what was the oak in the gall on the opening slide? I think I supplied that. That's uh, a, uh, a crystalline gall wasp, and that was on a California scrub oak. And we may have missed one earlier. Do galls have more nutrition? Do you want to take that one, Marav? I'm not sure I understand the question. Oh, I can, I can clarify. So there, oh, the gall, you. yeah, Marav. Um, so the gall is like a house for the egg and stuff, but it has it also adjusted like the way maybe more sugars are in the um, gall or for the larva to eat, like has it adjusted the way the nutrition is in the gall compared to, to the actual, like just the stem or the leaf? Yeah, yeah, great question. So yes, uh, especially the gall wasps. So they have specialized layers inside the galls that provide nutrition to the gall inducer, to the little larva inside. So yeah, they do everything just for the little insect. I mean, unintentionally, of course. Um, so, yeah. So let's see, are galls considered parasitic or commiseralistic or both? Um, I would say uh, it, it's a combination. So we, you know, as Mirav described, there's a, a variety of uh, relationships that exist, exist with the galls, but for the most part, the galls don't harm the plants that much. Um, and uh, I, I like to, I, I heard a really good characterization. We have this concept of an evolutionary arms race where insects and plants are kind of battling it out. Um, you know, once, you know, the insects are trying to eat the plant, the plant is adapting with new chemical uh, defenses. Galls are almost a truce in that evolutionary arms race where the plant has figured out or the insect, depending on your perspective, has figured out how to limit the damage that's caused to just this specific growth. Uh, but of course, there are always exceptions to this. Um, so Marav, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think this is good. I see that Terry wrote another uh, message regarding the mites. So I don't know that that gall mites could bite, but you know, if you saw an article about it, it could be true. I just don't know. Um, I would guess that you know, being so highly specific they specialize on these plants but it could be okay why don't you guys um continue on yeah so i'm going to attempt to share we just learned about some interesting biology of the insects and arthropods or other arthropods that induce gall so let's talk about fungi galls for a moment because the biology is a little bit different so there's actually fossil evidence of fungi induced galls from over 200 million years ago. And that far exceeds the fossil evidence of insect inducing galls. So as is very often the case, it seems like fungi figured this out first. There are three major groups of fungi inducers that we cover here uh, with some examples that are shown. One um, is uh, exobasidium fungi, which it's named that way because spores are produced on the surface of the plant rust fungi and sac fungi. And the sac fungi are those leaf curl examples here in the lower right. There's also powdery mildew that produces uh, witch's broom that's considered a gall. And I suspect there's some other groups of fungi inducers around the world, uh, but the, this is what we're covering here. So let's take a closer look at a very common one in California. Uh, it's called the coyote brush rust. And despite its name, it actually can induce galls on multiple different Baccarus species. Uh, so again, common names are not always the best indicator of the biology. So this is pretty amazing to me to look at. Uh, I, I realize it's zoomed in here. It's about a five inch stretch of a coyote brush, maybe, maybe a little bit less. And it seems like the fungi is just bursting out of the stem and it begs the question, how, how is this possible? So gall inducing fungi have similar biology to other parasitic fungi. And this is a parasitic relationship going back to the question from a moment ago. Uh, you know, they need spores to reproduce. They need proper conditions to germinate. And then they sprout tiny thread like hyphae that then grow into mycelia. And if we look closer here, you can see these are actually spores. These orange things are spores erupting out. And there's a characteristic stem widening that often happens with these rust fungi. But again, when you look at this, 
how does a fungi gain such an integral foothold? It's not like the insects that have a larva chewing its way inside or an ovipositor to insert an egg. So the short answer is never underestimate the power of mycelia. They can be quite strong and actually penetrate perfectly healthy tissue on the plants. Um, now there is some documentation that wounds on plants, plant wounds could be more susceptible. Uh, so like everything, there are exceptions, but, uh, but they can just penetrate right through healthy tissue, which I find very fascinating. Then they establish their foothold and uh, complete their reproductive cycle um, as we showed. And I wanted to show another really ex interesting fungal gall. I took this photo uh, on a toyon leaf and that's a common tree here on the west coast. And it was about one and a half centimeters wide, the gall, not the tree for those paying attention. Um, this is believed to be a gymnosporangium fungi and it's a, also a type of rust. And those spikes coming out, they kind of look like someone took a, one of those Play-Doh fun factory and is like pushing down on it and the Play-Doh is coming out or a pasta maker or something like that. Those are actually spore tubes. Uh, so that's part of its reproductive cycle here, uh, which, which I find it's like just fascinating to look at. Now, an interesting thing here though about rust fungi is they can sometimes affect multiple hosts. And uh, we have a genus here, at least a presumed genus, the gymnosporangium. And it's uh, the reason why we say presumed is because this is the same way it looks on other hosts that, uh, that it occurs on. It's never been documented on Toyon officially or scientifically. So it's unclear if this is an existing species that's just affecting the Toyon, which is quite possible, or a new species that's undocumented uh, that's specific to the Toyon. So it's an interesting discovery and um, you know one of the many fun things you might find out in the field. So speaking of finding galls in the field, you know, we do want to spend some time talking about how do you go about finding galls. We've shown lots of interesting, colorful galls, nice and up close photos, um, but galls can sometimes be a little hard to find, even the colorful ones. So I wanted to show some other examples here with my fingers for scale. So you can see that some of these galls are actually quite small. So I could say, if you want to find galls, just go look closely at plants and that's kind of glib. And while it's true, it's not very helpful. So for me, the, the, my approach tends to be to really purposefully switch my attentional filter and set a search image in my mind. So go out there, I, I, I can't go out and look for galls and bird at the same time. That's just too much for my brain to handle. So uh, I, I kind of focus on the galls. I think about what I'm looking for. And then when I find an interesting plant, I might scan it from different perspectives, looking at the leaves and then looking at the twigs and then looking at the flowers or the fruits. So technique aside, you might be wondering where to look. And of course the search starts with plants. As we talked about before, uh, it's a really good approach to think about what plants you might want to go look at. We talked about the oaks and the willows and hickories and other things. And, um, you know, great resources to help you in preparation. There's the field guide that Marav mentioned. We'll have links to this uh, later. Rusto's Guide to Western Gauls. There's an excellent website called Golf Formers uh, that you can search. And there are plenty of projects on iNaturalist that you can investigate to see what's being seen in your area. And these four galls here, I think it's a good example. Uh, they're all seen on coyote brush. They're all relatively common. And in fact, you can find all four of these on the same plant sometimes. So it's a, it's a good example where you encounter a coyote brush. And if you have these search images in your mind or a field guide nearby that you can look at, you can start looking for these things and they might magically appear in front of you. So recall this list. Uh, you know, these are the plants that we tend to focus on. But I also want to let you all know that even though these are the, the most prolific producers, some of the most common galls, most frequently seen galls don't grow on these plants. For example, if I look at iNaturalist, there's a project called Galls of North America. The fourth most commonly seen gall is the one pictured here called the thistle stem gall fly. And this actually grows on creeping thistle. It's not even a native plant in the United States, um, yet it's the fourth most common gall that's observed. So uh, don't close your mind to other plants as well. Think about, you know, odd, um, 
odd growths that uh, that might be occurring and those should jump out at you and, and maybe stimulate further investigation. So when to find galls? Well, Marav talked a little bit about this already. You know, spring um, is a great time where you have uh, uh, a new generation of galls forming or late summer to fall, um, you know, especially for the cinepid wasp galls. Uh, it's, these are the times you're likely to find fresh galls. But I, um, of course, and, and just to make that clear, it's, it's the reproductive cycles that really drive this. And, um, you know, some of the fungi galls you can find pretty much constantly as long as, it, as the weather conditions are right for germination. Um, but winter can be good as well. Other months can be good as well. And it just requires changing your perspective. So for example, some of those cryptic stem galls might be much more easily visible in the winter if a tree has lost all of its leaves. Some of the roseate galls that form don't drop when leaves drop and they become more obvious. And when the leaves do first drop at the beginning of fall, before they've uh, started to decompose, you could actually find galls on the ground just by investigating the leaf fall and uh, you know picking up some leaves and taking a look. And uh, that can be a very good way to discover some galls that you can't otherwise see because they're just simply too high up in the tree. So this data here, this graph, I thought it'd just be kind of fun to see what some of the iNaturalist data shows. And this you know, it's not normalized data. It doesn't account for uh, observation hours or other events that are happening, but you can kind of see this trend uh, of what people see. And Marav is gonna talk a little bit more about Gall Week here in a moment for those wanting to know more, like what is this Gall Week thing that we've uh, talked about. Uh, so in 2021, you can see the result of Gall Week, that big spike in October. So this year we have Gall Week a little bit earlier. I expect to see a big spike as well. So as I said, um, there are many unexpected or undiscovered galls as well. That Toyon fungi gall was one. I found some in my backyard that uh, are undocumented, believe it or not. Um, so it's always worth looking at a plant through these different lenses that I talked about. Look for abnormal things, scan the leaves, scan the twigs, scan the fruits. If something doesn't look quite like you expect, investigate it a little bit more. And if you're looking for abnormal things on plants, inevitably you're going to encounter a situation where you're like, is this a gall or not a gall? I just, I, I can't tell. Uh, so there are some attributes that you can check to uh, help to determine that. And sometimes it can still be very mysterious, but hopefully these next few examples that I go through will give you at least a foundation for making these determinations. Some of the attributes listed here were discussed by Marav earlier. Uh, but these will be some practical examples. So looking at this picture here on the right, it's on a leaf edge that some galls do grow on leaf edges. So, so that's possible. Um, most galls would be attached. You know, is this one attached? Well, some might be attached, but very brittle. And if you touch it, it could fall off easily, but there would still be evidence of a point of growth on the leaf. Remember the plant was induced to grow this thing. So there should be some indicator that that the item you're looking at is attached. Is it different from other growth that you see on the plant? That's pretty self-explanatory, but if you see a pattern uh, that can help give you some clues, are there similar structures in similar placements? Yeah, that's another, another thing to look at and consider. You know, it's not uncommon for a plant to have many instances of a specific gall species. And some of the pictures we showed earlier uh, showed some of that where you see multiple instances of a gall on a single leaf. Do you see exit holes? Remember, if it's not a fungi gall, there's something living in there and at some point it has to exit. Um, now, of course, there's a chance that it died uh, before being able to exit. So um, that's not a perfect indicator as well, but it's another clue. And does it have a chamber inside? So as Marav mentioned, some galls have a single chamber, some have multiple chambers, some have empty chambers. Uh, it's very interesting, but in order to determine that you would actually have to destroy the gall or the gall would already be, be dead and you're investigating it after the fact. So that's something that you may or may not wish to do. So what are your thoughts on this photo? I'm pretty sure, by the way, this is on a coast live oak leaf. If anyone is interested in the host plant, I'll give you just a second to think about it. And the answer here is this is not a gall. Um, so I'll, uh, explain the rationale. 
So despite its placement, you know, it wasn't attached. It just fell off. There was no indication of attachment. It's also very moist. Most galls are not moist, which is uh, um, not always true. There's always exceptions, but, but usually not. Um, it looks like it's actually maybe part of a berry uh, that fell from another plant nearby. And that's actually a very common uh, situation that you have some plant matter falls onto another plant and it looks a bit like a growth or a gall or something. Uh, so that's something that you will encounter. So we'll play a couple more rounds of this gall or not a gall. And I have some clues here as to some of the things we're going to cover. Okay. So this leaf, now, of course, you don't have the advantage of being able to look at it, manipulate it up close. So, uh, you know, I understand this isn't a perfect game, but uh, it's on a, uh, a red berry buckthorn. And um, you know, let's give you a moment to look at it, think about it. Oop, I clicked a little too fast there. This is actually a gall. So this was induced by a moth. It caused the leaf to grow in this curled up folded form. So. Um, if you were to open it up, you'd see there was a chamber in there. You'd see some thickening of the leaf as well. Uh, so this is a gall. Now for comparison, uh, other leaf folding and leaf rolling for that matter, there's a couple of different terms here. A, a leaf could be folded or rolled. Um, insects or arachnids may do this through mechanical means, which would not be a gall. And you can see some clue here on this picture. Uh, there's a little bit of silk that you can see that is connecting the two parts of the leaf. And um, this was actually made by a spider. So there's a spider living inside of, of this fold. So this is something you will encounter quite a bit. Uh, it's also very interesting. It's just outside of the scope of what we're talking about today. It was mechanically done by an insect. It's not, um, it's not the plant that grew into this shape. Okay, so this one here, depending on how good your internet connection is and what sort of resolution, it might be a really easy one for you to figure out, but uh, I'll describe what I found. Uh, I believe this was on a coyote brush. It was a hard white globular thing, very hard. Uh, and, um, you know, I could touch it and, and tell it was solid. So I'll let you think about this for a moment. And this actually was not a gall. It was a desiccated spittle bug foam. So spittle bugs create this really foamy mass that when it's fresh, it's actually wet and you can touch it and it will stick to your fingers. And if you look really, really closely here, you can even see some bubbles still in there, but it actually solidified into a hard form complete with the bubbles in there. So from a distance, especially if you don't have great eyes like me, it looked like it could be a gall, but turns out it was just a spittle bug. Here's something that I found just a, I don't know, a week and a half ago on a eucalyptus leaf. And it's, you know, a little bit dirty. I think it had been on the leaf for a while. You're going to find things like this that have been out there a while and are starting to maybe not be in best shape. And a spider built some webbing around it. And when I touched it, I'll give a couple of clues as to what I found. When I touched it, 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 it was very brittle and it fell off very easily. And it was not a gall. This was actually created by an insect called a red gum lerp psyllid. And like a lot of insects, it likes to eat the plant juices and then create honeydew. And it uses this honeydew that it, it excretes as a little protective cap or shell over it. So again, it's a case where there, there is insect herbivory going on, but it's not a gall. It actually created this as a uh, form of protection. So here's another really interesting one. This big growth is on an oak tree trunk. And I think a lot of you might be familiar what, what, with what this is commonly called. And I'm sorry, I can't see the chat right now as I'm presenting. So I, um, people may be answering and I don't know. But uh, gall or not a gall? So this is not a gall. It's actually called a burl. And these are outgrowths. This one here is huge. They, they don't have to be this big, uh, but they can occur on trunks or branches. And 
Uh, they're usually induced by some sort of injury or stress, or it could even be induced by a fungal infection. Uh, but unlike galls, these don't serve a reproductive purpose. So it's still an interesting thing to find. Um, and in the Bay Area, there's lots of trees that commonly have burls for various reasons. Uh, California Bay, redwoods, even some sycamores, others do. So this is something you will definitely find in the field. And while we're on the subject of burls, some, another question that does come up sometimes, especially with redwoods, but probably other trees, is like, what's this thing at the base? And this is a basal burl or a lignotuber, and they can start growing at a very young age. It, based on research, it seems like most of them are genetic in origin, so they aren't being induced by another organism. So again, not a gall. All right, just a couple more. So this is a fun one. What about this one? So we see some interesting things here. We see a structured format. Uh, there's a exit hole that's obvious. There's even a little hatch. You can see where, um, where the insect exited from. And I'll give you a hint. It's common name is Mexican jumping bean. So gall or not a gall. All right, we're on a, a run here of not a gall. So this one is actually not a gall. It's an example of a fruit borer. So early on in the seed pod development, when they're still green and fresh, uh, a, you know, an, an egg will have already been laid on the plant and the larva will burrow its way in. And it just hangs out in there as the seed matures. Uh, it's a moth that, uh, that does this. And eventually it does emerge and it creates some of these same uh, characteristics that you might see in a gall, but in this case, it didn't induce the plant to grow the seed. It would have grown it anyway. And there's lots of insects that take advantage of fruit, um, you know, in that way. Okay. Last one, I promise. So this object, not to give away the answer, uh, is growing on a really good host plant. It's a Canyon live Oak. So gall or not a gall. So this is another confusing one. There's, uh, it's actually a scale insect. It's not a gall. Uh, it comes from a family that is actually called gall like scale insects. So, uh, I had to learn this one the hard way. I think Mirav actually probably was the one that helped, helped me figure this out when I first discovered it. But, uh, it, uh, it looks so much like a gall. I thought for sure it was a gall. There are certain galls that have patterning like this as well. Um, but, uh, or I shouldn't say like it, it's similar, not the same, uh, but it's actually a scale insect. So, uh, iNaturalist is your friend with these sorts of things. They can really help point you in the right direction and get you in the right ballpark anyway, for what you're looking at. So to talk a little bit more about iNaturalist and close out before we go to Q and a, uh, Marav, I'll stop sharing it over to you. Thanks. Okay. So. If you're like us, uh, obsessive uh, documenting, obs obsessively documenting what you see, then you might want to document uh, goal observations. And for that, if you could, yeah, move on. Um, I think it's really important to always write the host species, even if you're just using a uh, nature journal or if you're using iNaturalist like we do. Uh, if you don't know what the host is, you can document it. You can create another observation and have it there. Uh, you can add it into gold projects that will help you get it identified and contribute to these different projects. There are different projects for uh, specific places and for larger areas. And then you can add annotations. There's a cute little one called Gulls, yeah, right there. And then you can add fields, which would be the host plant. Uh, and that will allow people, including yourself, uh, to filter out results and find uh, all the observations that were found on Coast Live Oak, for example. So that's really helpful. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about Gull Week. So we have this awesome event going on. Uh, people already uploaded observations from 28 states and plenty, con plenty of countries in Europe and other places. And it's, it's really awesome. The event started uh, September 3rd 
and it will go until September 11th. You can document species during these dates and then you can upload them during the week. Uh, in order to do that, all you need to do is join the project and then add your observations manually. If you have any specific questions about that, you can always contact us later, but there are really good manuals on iNaturalist website. And I just wanted to share this slide about last year's event, which was the first Go Week event, uh, where we had people joining from many different countries. And it was just really awesome. Yeah, if you want to add that stuff, yeah. So last year it was early October, but some people from other states said that they actually don't see any plants at that time of the year. We can't imagine it here in California where it's still so hot and feels like the middle of the summer. But uh, so that's why this year we decided to do it uh, early September. And I think it's working well because there's so much to see. Uh, I wanted to include my website here since I have some uh, resources that could be useful, especially for local people. I have two guides uh, that you could print out and fold and take to the field with you. Uh, and I also have a couple of events this uh, weekend uh with keep cutting with beautiful and another event with michael so hopefully you could join us if you're local and i really want to share these resources with you we'll send you a list of of these resources and others at the end of the presentation but uh we use the russo book a lot and we're so glad that he has this new edition uh god former's website is an incredible resource Michael has wonderful uh, podcast interviews that you could listen to. There are a few of them about goals and even on Goal Week. So we will include all these links and then BioBlitz Club. And I also want to thank my friends Paul Heipel and Sarah Wheat who uh, helped create the original presentation. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you everyone for participating. And I would love to um, open it up for questions. There were a few that were in the uh, one of the questions that came up was um, adding previous galls to gall week. I know you said that the time frame is the third through the eleventh, but um, can people add? To galls that they found before that time. So if you find galls before September 3rd, please don't add them to the project because this is um, only for that week, which is actually not a real week. It's a bit longer. Uh, there are lots of other uh, gall projects and I would encourage you to add your observations to all of the relevant projects. So galls of North America, galls of California or whatever state you live in or a specific park. There are many different projects. So you could look for local projects and join them because this is how you can find your community. This is how you can find people that will help you identify them. Maybe you can connect with people. Uh, it's a good way to, to make connections with, with great people. But for Goal Week, we ask you to go out now. So if you just heard about it now, you still have a few days left, including the weekend where you can go out and document things and then uh, share them. Michael, this one might be for you. You had a number of labels that were underneath the galls and the insects causing the galls are names, but are the galls also labeled uniquely? Yeah, um, so usually it's a shared name. So they'll have, and it gets kind of strange from an English uh, grammar perspective. So you might say something like, uh, it's a beaked twig gall wasp you know, which, which is, is correct. And it's also the gall. So then you might say it's a beaked twig, gall, wasp, gall. Um, so, <laughs> uh, it, it is, it is a shared name. Um, and it, it does uh, get confusing now, not everything has a common name though. So a lot of these, uh, only have a Latin name and you don't encounter that same problem. You can just refer to it by the Latin name in those cases. Of course, most of us aren't walking around, uh, with all of that memorized. Uh, so we find ourselves sometimes shortcutting it and saying things like, oh, it's the uh, pink bow tie gall or, you know, something like that. Um, and then the, the, the last point I will add with 
naming and taxonomy, there's still a lot to a lot to learn, a lot to be found. And even like say if you're coming at galls from a perspective of birding and you pick up that Russo book that Marav mentioned, which is a great book and I do recommend it, you might be a little bit surprised to find that there are a whole bunch of species listed in there that don't have names. They're undescribed by science. They're known to exist. The host plant and uh, and um, and, and uh, you know details of of the type of gall that's generated are documented, but nobody has actually reared the insect and then gone through the process of documenting its characteristics so that it can be named and appropriately documented. So you're going to find a lot of galls that just have uh, somewhat ambiguous names because there's still a lot to be discovered. Another question is, what's your favorite gall or favorite gall name, either scientific or common? I'm terrible with favorites. <laughs> I like them all for different reasons, depending on the context. <laughs> Yeah, and you don't want anyone to get offended, right? <laughs> that's what my son says when people ask him. So, yeah, I don't know. There's plenty of favorites for me. I mean, all these little cute pink, purple things with dots and things. Yeah, I do. I do like the one that's over my shoulder uh, in my Zoom background. The that is the beaked twig gall wasp um, that grows on. Uh, scrub oak and leather oak and related species. Uh, so that is one that's, that would be on my list if I had to come up with a favorite list. There are a couple more questions in the chat. Yeah, I saw a question by Ron earlier asking about something that I noticed as well, that sometimes you'll see, you know, a few huge valley oaks, for example, and one of them would be covered by red cone galls, like hundreds of them and the tree next to it has none or just a few and maybe five other species that the nearby tree doesn't have so you could have species of the same tree okay same valley oak growing one next to the other but they have very different gall community and as far as i know we don't really know why so part of it could be because you know the tree is a bit different maybe if it's planted maybe it originate from a different place. Maybe there's something about the tree itself, the way it smells. Uh, I don't know, maybe they can fight that. I, I really don't know, but I think it's really interesting. And it's something that you might notice if you look, you're looking for gods uh, for a while. But it's, it's very interesting. And I think that's, that's part of why I find gods so interesting, because there's so much we still don't know. So I feel confident saying, I don't know. There's a lot of interesting areas that uh, are, I, I believe, active research, too, in terms of height of galls. Uh, I think that there's a, a, a graduate student, I think I read this, so don't hold me to it, but a graduate student that is measuring where galls are induced by height on some, uh, on some different trees, which will be interesting to see if there's a certain species that prefer a certain height. And then something else to add to what Marav said. Uh, I, I was out this week quite a bit and a lot of the blue oaks I saw do not look healthy. And those blue oaks, I, they're probably drought stressed or other stresses, did not have very many galls on them. But the blue oaks that looked healthy were much more likely to have galls. So I, I suspect that very basic uh, description is that you know, the insects can detect the, um, the viability of their host. And there's probably some correlation there. But like Marav says, it's conjecture. Um, I see a question here about hyperparasites, which are parasites that uh, use other parasites as their hosts. And that definitely um, happens. So the parasites that use uh, galls as their hosts um, have parasites themselves, but just we didn't have time to include all that stuff. So this is very complex. You have one organism inducing the gall and then another wasp that would go in there and try to parasitize that organism. And then another species of wasp, so a third species, that would try and get there and parasitize the parasite, which I think is like, wow, this is crazy uh, and so interesting. 
Thank you everyone for joining us for the webinar, Plant Galls for the Curious Naturalist. We had a terrific presentation from Rob and Jack and Michael Hawk and lots of questions. I hope you've enjoyed learning what galls are, how they are started, some of the host plants and how to find them. We encourage you to look for, observe, and document these unique structures by paying close attention to not only the leaves and twigs of plants and trees, but also on the ground among the leaf litter. Don't forget to document what you find on iNaturalist. And we hope you'll participate in Gall Week 2022, which started on iNaturalist Saturday, September 3rd, and runs through Sunday, September 11th. And check out the Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful and BioBlitz.club websites for upcoming BioBlitz events. A video of this webinar will be posted within two days via the Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful YouTube channel. Additionally, an email will be sent to registrants with the link to the video and a list of the resources discussed in the webinar. Thanks again for participating. And, and thank you everyone who, who did attend. If you have to leave, we totally understand. Uh, but I see a question here. Uh, someone works in landscape and they've seen galls on a, uh, a ficus and often gardeners think it's a pest and apply lots of pesticides. Do you have any information on ficus galls? And I guess I'll start with acknowledging that when gardeners, and I, I've put, I'll put myself in that categorization at various points in my life, when, when we discover something eating our plants that's unexpected, it can be scary. And that's a very common reaction, like, oh no, I need to go do something about it. That's true for leaf mining insects, it's true for lots of things. And, um, and very often, uh, it's an overreaction. It's something that's been happening, or it's a it's a cycle uh, that uh, that plants go through. I personally do not know anything about the ficus galls, uh, so I don't know if that's something to be worried about if someone is trying to grow this as an ornamental or not. Uh, Marav, do you happen to know? Oh, sorry, I was trying to read the the questions. Uh, <laughs> I lost you. Uh, do you know Do you know anything about the ficus? Um, Oh, I saw that question. And, and whether they mm -hmm. are uh, a a concern, like from an ornamental gardening perspective. So, I mean, just like other galls, like you have these galls on peaches and other plants, they definitely don't look great. Uh, they probably are not a huge toll on the tree, so the tree is not going to die, but it might not look very pretty. So I can understand why. Uh, someone would want to get rid of them. It might not be very easy because, uh, you know, hiding in those galls, they might be protected from pesticides as well. If I had them in my yard, I'd be very happy. You know, I'm going to document some of my backyard galls for Gall Week, obviously. And those add to the diversity. Obviously, those are non-native species. If I have a non-native plant in my yard that has galls, it would probably be a non-native species. But it's still, you know, it adds to the diversity of my backyard and I'm going to document that. Uh, people that have plants and like them to be pristine and clear and all that might want to spray them with something. I don't know anything about that because I like the bugs. One perspective I like to give uh, on this more general topic um, is that, you know, uh, so many people, uh, like, so I'm thinking of a gardener, they, they probably know about the relationship that monarchs have with milkweeds and how monarchs require milkweeds as part of their life cycle. And very often to, um, to a layperson, you know, that, that's kind of a eye opening experience to hear that, that there's, there's this beautiful insect that is part of our world that requires one type of plant. But it turns out, as you heard today, that that is not such an exception you know we we sometimes position it the media sometimes positions this as a um, as an exception but there are lots and lots of insects that have these um you know ob obligatory obligate relationships with specific plants and um, it's part of the food web it's part of what sustains you know the diversity that we have all around us so you know i also if somebody is kind of on the fence whether they want to do something about it whether they can uh, handle having some plants that look a little bit off because there is some insect activity on it. Uh, yeah, I try to position it that way. So maybe that's helpful, maybe not, but that's just what I do in those situations. There's a question here about uh, hybrid trees uh, that don't have galls. So from my experience, I think they do, but you know what, I'm, I'm not actually sure. Um, so we know that some of the oaks hybridize uh, if they're closely related, like blue oak and valley oak in this area would hybridize. 
But as far as I've noticed, they actually do have goals. And I was documenting goals on these hybrids all morning today. Uh, but maybe other plants don't have goals. I guess the question would be how different the outcome would be from the original tree. So let's say a valley oak and a blue oak are so closely related, they can share many of the gall species uh, so that you could find those both on a valley oak and a blue oak and on the hybrid. But maybe with other trees, that would be kind of different than, you know, the original uh, plant, the mother plant, that the gall inducing organism cannot use them. So I don't know, I guess it depends on the plant. That's, that's my question, but I don't know. Michael, do you know more about that? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I think that there are some questions as to whether certain, maybe some are less viable than others. I don't know. Um, I, I doubt there's been a study that's really looked at, at this because you'd have to do a genetic analysis of the plant, you know, and, and then do some sort of long-term longitudinal measurements. Um, but I, I've seen galls for sure on hybrids. I also know that looking around the Bay Area, there are a lot of non-native oaks that don't have very many galls or any at all in some cases that, um, you know, that they just aren't native here. So the local insect populations uh, can't take advantage of them. So that's something that also happens that can muddy the waters a little bit. Uh, as Marav mentioned, some of these wasps and mites and aphids and other things, they're tiny. They don't really, they aren't mobile. So unless people are picking them up and moving them, which does happen, of course, um, then then these uh, these insects aren't going to find some of the non-native oaks or non-native things that, that are planted around here. So speaking of anthropological topics, uh, there were two questions that were somewhat related. Coulter asked, do you know if there is any record of indigenous people documenting or using galls? And Helen asks, are any galls useful to humans? I know a few are used for dyes. Are there any other uses? I like the the dyes. Um, just on a side note, there that's there's some famous stories that uh, a lot of ink dyes were based on galls in Europe, and even uh, I think the Declaration of Independence is said to have been written with some gall ink, and probably many other famous documents as well. Um, I I like to say that that they're all useful to humans because we can enjoy them as part of nature. But I, I know that's not exactly what the question is is getting at. Uh, and unfortunately, I, I'm not uh, I'm not sure uh, of any other uh, like trivia that might be related to how galls have been used in different ways. Um, I, I'm sure there have been ways. Uh, Marav, do you do you have anything off the top of your head? So I know about the ink, but I also know that people do use them now. I'm not sure how exactly, but you can buy them on Amazon. So I guess they're useful for something. <laughs> and I think the indigenous question is really fascinating. Uh, because it, you know certainly they were known and um, and and you know, go out on a limb, likely used in some way in uh, uh, indigenous cultures. So I think that's a really interesting thing that you know I'll uh, spend some time seeing what I can find out. In fact, Martha posted in the chat that uh, there was a documented indigenous use of oak galls in the book California Indians and Their Environment by Kent Lightfoot and Otis Perry. So. We'll include that as part of the uh, list of resources. I know that most galls are not edible, <laughs> so I, uh, I, I think you can eat them, um, but some are highly toxic or um, uh, uh, will have lots of tannins and, and they're just not palatable. Um, and, and generally, I don't think they've all been tested. Some are probably uh, not edible, but they aren't eaten uh, by and large. Yeah, people are writing some really good comments about the uh, ink cues and other things. This is really interesting. I see that Ron asked, have scientists identified the chemicals that cause gall formation? Um, I think only very few have been studied to that degree. And the mechanisms are still not well understood, even in those cases. Um, Doug Tallamy has talked a little bit about this uh, in the past, and um, I don't know, Marav, do you have uh, any more up-to-date information? No, I'm not sure, but I agree that probably very few species were studied to that level because, I mean, we really don't know much. Even the big apple galls that we uh, talked about, you know, and mentioned a few times uh, this evening, 
even about them we don't know much we only know of their spring generation that has females only in it uh, and there might be another generation that is out there but we just don't connect the dots so there's just a lot we don't know and i don't know enough about this subject when i asked a similar question to uh, to dr talamy he's a uh, well-known entomologist uh, he he talked about the fact that uh, very often they don't even know the timing when this is happening and then when these wasps are almost invisible to the naked eye uh you know it's it's very very hard to track these down and and do an appropriate study so uh it's it's extremely challenging from lots of different perspectives so annie has a question um which i think you answered earlier michael maybe is the relationship of plant with gall symbiotic mutualistic or something else yeah, so um, just the, the quick recap on that. Um, so it's, there's never a blanket answer. It's, um, I, I would say that it's generally not damaging to the plant. And the characterization I gave earlier is, is we have this concept of the evolutionary arms race where plants are trying to eat or take it, or excuse me, insects are trying to eat or take advantage of plants. And the plants then come up with a chemical defense to uh, hold off the insect, and this goes on. Um, and uh, some people almost characterize galls as a truce of the evolutionary arms race because the um, the potential damage or scope is withheld to just this this gall. Um, you know, there are some documented cases where uh, a, a large outbreak of gall inducers have been damaging to trees. Um, you know, so this this has happened in the past. There are some environments that are more likely to have species that induce galls. I'm from the Bay Area, uh, but moved to the Sonoran Desert. Well, I know from, I used to live in the Sonoran Desert. I know that there are lots of galls in the Sonoran Desert. And um, if you can get up into some of the hills that, uh, that have scrub oaks and, and other things, you'll find a lot of interesting things, riparian areas with Fremont cottonwood uh, and so forth. Uh, so I think, again, it goes back to finding the plants that we listed before and looking for areas habitats that uh that support those plants that's a good spot a good place to look um thinking more about the desert you know there's a lot of desert uh creosote bushes and um uh, some of the rabbit brush and other things that do well in the desert um, have lots of galls too so uh, i think most places you're going to find a lot of galls uh, and one way to find the right host plants or to find, you know, galls that you might want to uh, explore as well is to use iNaturalist. So if you use iNaturalist and look for what other people found in your area or in, you know, the Sonoran Desert, for example, you could go into uh, galls of North America, for example, and see what observations were made in that area and actually limit that. So you could use filters on iNaturalist. You could go to the observations from that project and then filter it to the Sonoran Desert, for example. And then you get the list of all the different species that were found in the Sonoran Desert. Then you, from that, you could learn what are the best host plants uh, and what are the best galls or the most common galls you could find and then less common species and even if you don't know anything about the plants so i was visiting joshua tree uh, last year and i was really interested to find some new goals so of course I, I looked at the very few oaks that i found but in most of the places I, I visited there were no oaks so i just looked at random plants and tried to figure out if something is a seed or a fruit of that plant or a normal growth or if it's something else and then often it's like oh this is a goal i've never seen it before i don't know what the plant is but you can document the plant someone might help you later on uh, identify it and then you can document that growth and maybe upload that to the local project and see what people say because there might be like a local expert that you can connect with so there's another question here and sorry if i missed any um getting towards the bottom are galls an adaptation to create protection from drought that's an interesting thought i hadn't thought of that adaptation angle um, i do see you know some of the adaptation uh, aspects here that 
by inducing the plant to grow this food in a enclosure that protects you, like th those are the obvious adaptations I see. Um, and like, you know, maybe how or why ha have we evolved to this point? Um, and interestingly enough, as you continue down this path, Marav talked about some of the parasitic wasps that, that have learned that they can come and take advantage of these galls. And, and you saw a picture of a wasp with an ovipositor, a very long ovipositor. So it could reach deep into a gall if it wanted to, and, and perhaps probe around and find the right spot, uh, to, to lay its egg. And this has actually been documented of some parasitic wasps doing things like that. Um, so, uh, so that's, I guess, where the evolutionary arms race has moved to, uh, now is, uh, is the, the parasites and the inquilins trying to take advantage of these nice, cozy, um, and, uh, uh, well-equipped homes <laughs> that the galls have uh, been able to induce plants to grow for them. And maybe I can add that many other species might use the galls that were induced by one species. So in addition to the inquilines, those roommates, uh, uninvited guests, and the parasites, there might be other species. So again, those big apple galls, uh, those could have up to 15 different species that would use the gall. So there's one species that created it, okay, and used the plant to create that structure. But then up to 15 different species might emerge from one of these galls within two to three years. They stay on the tree for a while, and then they could drop to the ground at some point. But it's still a really good structure. Something might use it. And by the way, dropping to the ground is part of the natural cycle because many of them grow on deciduous trees. So valley oak, blue oak, other trees in our area and in different places. Part of the natural life cycle is that the leaves would drop to the ground, but uh, the fall goals are still in there and they are waiting for the right time for them to emerge. So if you're lucky enough to own one of these trees that produces galls on your own property, it's another good reason to leave some of the leaf litter, leave most of the leaf litter if you can, uh, to help support this, uh, you know, part of the life cycle, uh, just like other parts of, uh, of other herbivory strategies and reproduction strategies that insects have. Yeah, that's a very good point. And if you'd like to join our uh, goal week, all you need to do, it will send you the link you could uh, use that link, join the project, and then go out, make some observations and add them to the project. If you can add the host plant, that's very useful. Uh, if you don't know what it is, again, you could uh, document that. Uh, there are all sorts of posts there on the project where you could read how to get started with lots of different links to different projects in different countries and different states. Uh, this could be helpful for you if you're just getting started. You could uh, also uh, maybe team with other people. So we created a post there about outings. So if someone wants to invite other people to go out, I, I see that people are already like making plans here in Arizona. This is awesome. So you could do that on iNaturalist as well. We have a thread for that. Um, but uh, maybe we'll have some new friendships uh, coming out of this presentation. That would be awesome. So I've met naturalist hikes before and um, found galls on the ground and people have asked me if there are still creatures inside of them and I previously had thought if you can see exit holes probably there are not but is that accurate or is it probable that there would be other subsequent creatures that might still be in there? So both are correct if you see the exit holes then the gall inducer or maybe the parasite or someone else already uh, took off but there could be other organism inside and sometimes you could see that there are different sizes of these exit holes, which might, you know, show us that it was more than one species in there, uh, because the wasp should be somewhat the same size uh, if they're from the same species. And if you see larger and smaller holes, then maybe you had, you know, a little party inside. There's a really uh, an analogous example that probably exists with galls, and note, I'm saying probably because I, I don't know of any offhand, but uh, I think a lot of people are familiar with acorn weevils that uh, will actually chew into an acorn and, and create a little cavity inside and then emerge, and that acorn falls to the ground. Uh, at least in the eastern U.S., there's an ant species then that takes uh, advantage of that shelter and will actually use that hollowed-out acorn for a period of time uh, as well. So uh, I couldn't say 
almost with certainty, you know, those, those sorts of things are happening, um, with these, you know, solid galls. Now, some of the other galls are, are not quite so solid and, and probably, um, will, uh, uh, not persist long enough for that sort of use. Um, but, uh, anyway, I find that, uh, story, the acorn weevil and ant story, uh, compelling in this regard. So there's a question about neighborhood trees, if they could or could not have uh, galls on them. Oh, I mean, noticing less galls on neighborhood trees. Uh, in my neighborhood, I do see some uh, galls and some of them are actually non-common species, which I was, you know, kind of happy to find. I, I feel like part of the problem is that often the trees are trimmed that way that you can't actually reach any of the leaves. So it's only if you can find stuff on the ground uh or you know depending on the tree but often you'll have some native species in your neighborhood but you just can't reach the trees but I've, i have seen uh quite a few species in my neighborhood in like busy san jose and my neighborhood is not a very good example i'm pretty close to santa Teresa county park so um there's probably a lot of crossover from <laughs> from the habitats over there this is probably a question for the future uh, by listening to a talk for California Native Plant Society about climate impacts on oaks. I may have been on that one with uh, Stu Weiss. Um, is some dedicated researcher watching all the field data to document changes in distribution that might be attributed to climate change, i.e. plants uh, perhaps migrate north? Uh, are gall forming insects doing the same? I'm not aware of such research. Michael, yeah, I think this is a really that. good example of why iNaturalist is a good tool is because you've got all these people out there, citizen scientists who are collecting data and maybe there is a, enough time will go by that there might be the opportunity to see that using this um, community gathered data. Yeah, exactly. Well, Marav and Michael, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Got a lot of kudos in the chat. And um, do you have any closing words? Well, I guess all, all I would say is there is so much to learn about galls, about insects, uh, you know, in general. And if you start, if you get into this, if you start making some observations, posting them in your Naturalist, a whole world will open up uh, before you. So I highly encourage that. And you don't you don't have to go crazy like Marav and I are. We we po we <laughs> contribute so much. Uh, you can start small. Uh, so I would say just start, give it a try, and uh, and you'll be amazed. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's just such a beautiful little world, and all you need to do is just go and look for a little oak and start looking at the leaves. People will look at you weird, but that's fine. Just do it. And thank you so much for coming. It was, I mean, so many great questions. What a nice discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone.